three beads you got as you came in. I hope everybody got them. If they ran out, I'm sorry. Um, by they, I mean we. <laughs> They're because we're talking about prayer beads this morning. And so I'm going to be talking about beads in different cultures, and I'm going to be talking about prayer. And one of the reasons that people use beads is because we want to pray, and we want to breathe deeply to help our mental health or our blood pressure, but we don't. We just, we want to do it, but we don't do it. And we want to remember to say kind things to the people that we live with, and we want to remember to say the loving kindness meditation during the day, but we don't. We don't do it. And so having beads on a, on a string or in your pocket just rattling around can be a tangible reminder. They knock against your body and you go, oh yeah, I was going to say something nice to my spouse. What could it be? And then... <laughs> Then you'll think of your myriad possibilities, and you'll pick one and say it. Save the rest for later. Or pick three. And in fact, if you got something negative to say, they say the proper uh, proportion of negative to positive is 14 to 1. Yeah, so we got some work to do. So the beads are there to ground our attention, to help us with our senses focus on what we're trying to focus on. And they've been used from time immemorial by humans for prayer. We, we have uh, beads that look like prayer beads that we think are prayer beads uh, in Egypt in 3200 BCE. In fact, we have a fossil of a necklace of shell and bone but we don't know whether it was used for prayer or whether it was just for decoration there's no way to know that but these days one thing we do know is that two-thirds of the world's inhabitants two-thirds of the people on the planet use beads for prayer that's a lot of human beings grounding their attention with beads So maybe it started by people picking up a couple of stones and putting them in their pocket to remind them of things they wanted to do that day. Um, maybe when you say your prayers that you wanted to say, you take the stone out of your pocket and drop it on the ground so that you have maybe four little pebbles in your pocket and by the end of the day you have none and that lets you know you did what you were supposed to do or what you wanted to do. We have sandstone carvings from India from 185 BCE of people holding prayer beads in a temple kind of environment. And people in India use the same kinds of prayer beads that you see in the sandstone carvings today. Um, the, the necklace of prayer beads is called a japa mala. Japa means to say the name of God over and over again. And mala means garland or rose. The whole necklace has 108 beads in the Hindu tradition. And so since Buddhism came up out of Hinduism, the Buddhist prayer bead necklace has 108 beads as well, or a number that goes into 108 so that if you go two times around it or three times around it, you get to 108. And in the Buddhist tradition, the 108 things are, they represent the number of worldly desires or negative emotions that you have to overcome before attaining enlightenment. So you say a prayer about one of these emotions every day to try to let go of it. In Tibet, some of the beads were made out of the bones of the saints so that by praying and feeling the bones of the saints that you would um, be inspired to attain their level of saintliness. But today, the bone beads are usually made out of yak bone from Tibet, which I think is very good because yaks are very useful animals, and so you can be reminded to be useful in your life. It's interesting to me that mala means rose or garland. 
in Sanskrit, and that in the Christian tradition, the necklace of beads is called the what? The rosary. So um, sometimes the rosary beads were made actually out of roses, cooked and crushed, and the rose was a symbol of Mother Mary. So you would make um, beads and out of the very rose that reminded you of Mother Mary, and that would be the rosary. And I don't, I don't choose to believe that it's a coincidence. Um, as I was telling a friend the other day, uh, who said that perhaps cultures had gotten isolated after out of they after they came out out of the valley in Africa, they went to their places and got isolated. I said I'm not sure that they did get isolated because I believe in sailors. And there's always going to be somebody in every culture that's near a river or an ocean that's going to get on a boat and want to go somewhere. And so you find Phoenician beads in Viking sites in uh, Norway, and you find Viking runes in uh, uh, Arkansas on the Heavener runestone, and you find all kinds of the same things all over the earth, and traveling salesmen too. So you travel to trade, or you sail to trade, or you sail to conquer, or just to see what's out there, and uh, cultures get shared. So praying the rosary is something that uh, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and Orthodox folks have done for centuries. Now the Desert Fathers, just in case you want to know, these were saints who lived in the desert um, so as to eschew the... Uh, the um, trappings of civilization between the third and fifth centuries, they, instead of using beads, they would just tie knots in a strip of leather. And so they would say their prayers using the knots in a strip of leather. It works just the same. And some of them were pillar saints. I don't know if you've heard of the pillar saints, but they would climb up on a pillar and stay up there for 20 years while their disciples would pulley baskets of food up to them and um, the descriptions of them as uh, being saintly, holy on their pedestals, uh, dripping with vermin is my favorite uh, phrase about them, just because that's what young people like, the ew factor. <laughs> and typically, people who were um, praying at that time would use repetitive prayers. One of the ones the Desert Fathers used was the Jesus prayer, which is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they would say that over and over and over and over for hours every day. In Islam, prayer beads are referred to as misbaha, and they contain 99 beads because Allah has 99 names, and you meditate on the names of Allah. Beads have always had a spiritual um, weight in Native American spiritualities. Um, neck medallions as early as AD 800 served as talismans. Certain items of jewelry and other ornamentation are used in healing ceremonies um, to the present day. In Africa, the Yoruba believe that using beads enhances the power of ritual objects. The Maasai find beads so meaningful that in their language there are 40 different words for different kinds of beadwork. So we're Unitarian Universalists. How do we pray? Many different ways as you would have imagined. We pray from none at all over here to kind of meaning to pray but never getting to it over here to all kinds of meditation from spotty and sporadic to regular, to actual um, prayers to God as if God were a personality, all and everything in the middle. And we think and talk about prayer in so many different ways. You'll find people talking about prayer as if it were asking God to do something that God wouldn't ordinarily do if you hadn't asked. And sometimes um, people say, well, it's because God is a good parent, and good parents sometimes wait to help until they're asked. And um, so God is a good parent waiting to be asked. And some people, you know, because if you help before somebody's asked you to help, 
A lot of times they get mad. Um, that's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> and other people talk as if God were some kind of an arrogant king who says, yeah, I could help you, but you haven't asked yet. Uh, or you haven't asked correctly, or you had a little spot of doubt in there, I'm going to wait until you get rid of it before I do anything for you, which is not really the kind of God I would want to worship. I think that prayer is placing our focus, and I think that, that a bead or something tangible helps your senses and your body get the message that your brain is trying to focus because, you know, it's all connected, and so this gives your brain a little help in focusing. And it gives you a little reminder. If you're um, carrying them in your pocket, you feel it knocking against your leg, and you go, oh, yeah, it was gonna, I was going to say something good today. Um, and I think that focus, well-placed, helps you be there helps you be open for business, as Anne Lamott said, and helps you be there, as Annie Dillard said. Because that is the whole secret of not missing your life. You have to be there for it. You have to be open to business. And so I think, and my, um, one of my spiritual teachers named Wendy Palmer, and she says, in paying attention, you get what you pay for. So think of paying attention as actually giving to a thing or an event or a thought or a feeling. You pay attention and then you develop a relationship with that thing. Now Anne Lamott, as you heard um, in the call to worship, she has a book that says there are three basic kinds of prayers and really all you need is thanks and wow, and help. And I think we're all good with the thanks prayer. We do gratitude practice. That's one of our spiritual practices. Um, we, we say things that we're grateful for. And we understand that you can be kind of globally grateful without any particular belief about whom we're being grateful or to whom we're being grateful. Sorry about the syntax. Um, wow, we know that awe is one of the spiritual transformation experiences. When you, when you see the, the tree with the spring light in it, or when you, when you stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, or when you see any number of small and great things in nature, or where you sit at a table with uh, people who are joining this church for the first time and watch them listen to each other's stories, that's an awe-inspiring experience. And so you say, wow and your spirit is fed. Now, help is a little more problematic for me. Um, because sometimes I think, well, I don't believe in a traditional God with a personality who's sitting somewhere. Um, so who am I asking for help? But then I remind myself that I believe in a river of love that runs through the universe that we add to in our lifetimes. And I think I can reach out to love, the river of love, and ask for help and support. So I call out to love for help sometimes. And does it come from outside me? I don't know. Does it come from inside me? I don't know. Does it come from other people, from the animals, the rocks, the trees, the stars? Maybe. Does it come from spirits of people who've gone on before? Could be. Does it come from particles smaller than the boson that they haven't discovered yet that maybe somehow release energy when faced with desperation? I'm just making that up. They haven't discovered anything like that. <laughs> just in case you didn't know. I don't know. Or maybe it's just good for me to acknowledge that I need help because sometimes we don't, especially if we're uh, relatively well-fed, well-funded, well-privileged people in this world, we, we have the illusion that we can do it ourselves. And I don't think it really matters if the help comes. You've said help in your prayer and the help comes. That is beautiful. But because of the person I am and the minister I am, I have to say, there's also the chance that it won't come. 
and then you got a problem or you got to change a story. You got to tell yourself a story about why it didn't come. So what I'm saying to you is choose your beliefs because that's what everybody does. You choose your beliefs, but you have to choose understanding that whatever you choose is fraught. If you choose not to believe in any mystery of any kind, that's fraught with a certain heartbreak. If you choose to believe in a personal God, that's fraught with joy and heartbreak. If you choose to believe in a force of love, that's also fraught. You ask for help, nothing happens. What do you do? What do you think about that? But it's possible that prayer has nothing to do with asking for help. It's possible that repetitive prayer really does do something for the human mind and body. Now, the early desert saints in the Christian tradition talked about the Jesus prayer, saying it over and over again. They said what it caused was a pleasant heat um, after you'd said this for many hours a day, several days in a row, or a joyful boiling. I like that. It causes a joyful boiling. In the early 70s, which was long, long ago, in case uh, time has passed quickly for you, <laughs> Dr. Herbert Benson, president and founder of the Mind Body Medical Institute at Harvard Medical School, documented a phenomenon he called the relaxation response. He started out experimenting with Sanskrit mantras. And he branched out to the Jesus prayer. And then he found out that any word that meant something to a person could work. And if you repeated this for 10 to 20 minutes, breathing regularly and letting all thoughts pass you by, inviting your mind to be blank, but not trying too hard, he found that those who repeated these words for at least 10 minutes a day experienced physiological changes, reduced heart rate, lower stress levels, and a slower metabolism. It also lowered the blood pressure of people who have high blood pressure and generally decreased the oxygen consumption of your body and letting him know that you were in a relaxed state. So even if people were saying things like one or ocean or if they had found a phrase, a three-word or four-word phrase from a poem or a David Bowie song, then if you say it over and over again, it has the same relaxing effect on your whole body, mind, spirit. But then more recently, John Kabat-Zinn, a mindfulness meditation teacher, and the people at the University of Massachusetts found, and this is just a couple, three years ago, I think, they found that if you do mindfulness meditation, this repetition of a phrase, making your breathing deep and regular, inviting your mind to be blank, that it not only relaxed you, it not only lowered blood pressure, but it actually created new gray matter in your brain. So they've started treating patients with Parkinson's with mindfulness meditation, and with brain injuries with mindfulness meditation. Not that they know exactly what's gonna happen, but they used to think that the brain couldn't produce any more brain once you were born. Now they know, yes, it can. And that if you meditate, that's one of the things that does it. So we can use our three beads to do deep breathing if we want to. Just breathe deeply for each bead. That's a great start. Another way to do it is to do the loving kindness meditation. I don't know if you remember that we used to do it every Sunday a couple of years ago. And it goes like this. I'll say the words, you say them after me if you choose to, and hold a bead in your hand for each section. There are three sections. First section is the prayer the way we do it for ourselves. May I be free from danger. May I be mentally happy. May I be physically happy. May I have ease of well-being. And now you take your second bead and you're going to say it for somebody that you love. May I be free from danger. May I be mentally happy. May I be physically happy. 
May I have ease of well-being. And now the spiritual stretch. We say it for somebody against whom we have a resentment. It works whether you mean it or not. And it's good. May you be free from danger. May you be mentally happy. May you be physically happy. May you have ease of well-being. So you can use the beads like that if you want. If you don't remember the prayer, just Google any part of it and it'll all come up. But my strongest suggestion for today is that you take the beads and make them relate to our mission. How do we do that? All right, the first bead is about nourishing souls. So you would take the bead in your hand during your time of strengthening your spirit, and you would say, how did my soul get nourished today? Or what nourishment does my soul need today? Or how can I nourish somebody else's soul today? And then the second bead is about transformation. What part of my life needs transforming today? How has my life been transformed today? How can I contribute to the transformation of someone else's life today? And the third bead has to do with justice. What justice have I done today? What have I been part of? What justice do I need? And since nobody can be an activist every day, how can I support those who are actively working for justice today? Can I write a thank you note? Can I write a check? Can I take a meal? Can I go visit somebody in detention or jail? How can I be part of justice? Or how can I be justice today? How can I be transformation today? How can I be nourishment today? So I invite you to take the beads home and to tell your children these are for nourishment, transformation, and justice. These are our three beads for our mission from our church. And I invite you to use them as a spiritual practice. 